Welcome viewers to this edition of uh, Focus on Africans. Today is a very special edition, I will tell you why. We are privileged to have with us uh, a professor of uh, literature who has a very extensive knowledge of Africa, who has written extensively on uh, literature worldwide, globally, but also with a special focus on Africa. Uh, we've moved from Amsterdam, where today we're in uh, the city of Amsterdam, which is a, a suburb, actually, of uh, Amsterdam. We are privileged to have with us uh, Professor Mineke Skipper, a uh, professor of literature at uh, the world-known uh, African Study Centre at the University of Leiden. Please help me welcome uh, Professor Skipper to Focus on Africans. So, welcome to Focus on Africans and uh, thank you very much for giving us the privilege to interview you. Can you tell us something about yourself, please? Well, um, I was born in a family. My father was a reverend. Okay. And um, I was born in a family with five brothers and no sisters. You were the only lady? I was the only girl. Okay. And um, which made me feel very at ease wherever I came. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, you, you see, girls tend to be a more, uh, a bit intimidated sometimes by the things outside the house, but I have seen that boys can be as insecure as girls can be. So there's no difference in that respect. Mm -hmm. So my father said uh, it is important for my daughter to go to school and to learn as much as she can, as much as it is important for the boys. So um, I studied French and philosophy. Where, uh, where, where were you born? Which, which ah, there was a small village uh, called Polsbroek and uh, my father then moved as a reverend to another uh, city mm -hmm. and um, and finally I studied in Amsterdam. Okay, Polsbroek, which part of uh, Holland is it? Is, it is South Holland, oh, the, yeah. which is one of the provinces uh, in the in the west of okay. the country. How big, uh, how big was that? Uh, that village was a quite, s the small. village where I was born was quite small. small uh, uh, what are the things you remember from uh, growing up? Uh, the first thing I remember is that the Germans came and took my father away oh. uh, because there was a resistance movement in the in the village. In the and First uh, World War, the second, the second World War. <laughs> the Sorry. Second World War. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so I I remember seeing my mother crying and filling a small uh, suitcase with some bread and milk and cheese for, him to, take away. for him for him to take with him was he the assistant yeah well there were uh, you see i don't know so much about it because the people didn't talk much about it but that was one of the first memories i have and uh, but the the most important things came after the war and uh, so, well, mm. you, you always remember that there has been but this those, those memories of your father being uh, sent away stayed with you? Yes, of course, it stayed mm. with me. How old were you then? I think I was perhaps two or so, so oh, okay. very young, yes. Um, and, um, but fortunately, after a while, uh, he came back okay. and there, was some, there were some people who helped him out there. Okay. But you, what you was the impact on the family then? Were you still able yeah. to go to school? No, we, I wasn't going to school when I was two or three. Mm -hmm. So my, I started school after the war only. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and that was life then, going to yes, school? Yes, yes, yes. That was... Uh, but you see, the another thing I remember from that war is, uh, since we lived in a village, there were some farmers, so we had always food. Okay. But people from the cities, they had no food then, and uh, so they came to beg at the doors and... Uh, Begging uh, for food? For food, yes, because they were so hungry. People had nothing in the mm. cities. You see, in Africa, the idea is always that in the West, people are wealthy, they have everything. So when I was teaching later in Congo, mm -hmm. and I told the students that here women are cleaning not only their own houses, but other people's houses to have some money and that we have beggars in the street why beggars they laughed that they couldn't they believe me yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so the idea you have of people 
is very much mm. biased by the media mm, yeah. and by but, uh, looking back how did those uh, memories influence your life uh, i think it's very strong uh, belief in injustice and in human rights mm -hmm. and uh, well also because in the family you see my father was a reverend mm. so the message from the bible was a, a message also of justice mm. it doesn't mean that christians always <laughs> are fair and 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 just in their behavior but i think the message is there and and we picked it up yeah, from the family. Um, but you, as a share, you watch your father being a, uh, sent away. Did that strengthen your belief in humanity? Or? Uh, yeah, then you see that you cannot trust everybody yeah. all the time. But even then, you see, ever since, I've always thought you first at least give people the benefit of, of the, the doubt. doubt. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, don't, you don't become judgmental. No, 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 no. I think we should just uh, be open well, be to open the world. Open. All right, you have a very rich uh, and diverse background. Shall we begin at uh, the University of Amsterdam, where it all started? What do you remember from those days? Um, I was uh, very interested in literature always. I read a lot uh, all uh, over the years in school already. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry I to cut you, but was there a reason why you chose literature? Why you were so much interested in literature? Uh, no, I, I just you don't I don't. I think you I was interested. Yeah, explore, discover oh. the world, uh, know what other people think. You see, it is easy to be convinced that you know enough. But I think there is, uh, I was always keen mm. to know more. Did you grow up with books in the house? Yes, yes, yes. So your, father, your parents were always reading? Yes, yes, okay, yeah, of course, yes, yeah. And, and uh, the importance of going to school, uh, we, we, we had that awareness. Okay. Because my father told me, you see, I had a brother and a sister, me and my brother, we went to school. And my sister stayed at the house because the, the mother was a, bit, a little weak or okay. ill. And she was very intelligent, so he said, well, for me, five boys and a girl, they all oh, should yeah. go to school because I know my sister has suffered oh, from not from going to school. school. So what was the University of Amsterdam like in those years? The years? Free University. I was at the Free okay. University. Well, I think it was a good university. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, well, yeah. You see, I, I started studying French because English and German for me were easy languages. But I thought I'd take mm -hmm. French because mm -hmm. then I, at least I will be able to, to speak learn and learn French, okay. yes. Yeah, you studied French and philosophy. Yes, a philosophy because what? I was very interested in the relation between body and soul. What is the relationship okay. and you how... You like to ask uh, questions. Yes, yes. Asking mm. questions about life and death and about how we relate to other people. people. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, why the combination of French and uh, philosophy? That's <coughs> because, you see, uh, I think in literature you have ideas, mm -hmm. but how do ideas develop mm -hmm. in thinking? I think those are two aspects of what one okay. could be interested in. Uh, in, in knowing about But you could have in another language. I could have, yes, but yeah. I didn't. Uh, but you because, you see, the, the French theatre and French literature okay. are very rich, yes, in my opinion. Okay. And I didn't know much about it, so that can be a reason for starting, for, studying, uh, for uh, taking up that subject. So, and then later you moved to comparative literature at the yeah. University of uh, Utrecht. Yes, yeah. So, um, you started with the French and philosophy. Yeah. But you, you have always been interested in literature. Yes. Well, yeah. That's why you go into it. Oh. Yeah. So um, I did that because um, that, that what I studied that after I came back from Congo and the children were small and I couldn't find a job uh, easily. Okay. So we, after your philosophy, you went to Kodi Congo. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was going to ask you why. You were young, just graduated from college, uh, from university, yes. then you went to the Congo. My, my husband, uh, I had met my husband okay. then, and we decided that we could spend our whole lives in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. but that it might be interesting to go to another place. 
and uh, and and see more of of the, the world. world. And you see, it, that was in '64, mm -hmm. and uh, in the Congo, uh, people desperately needed teachers mm -hmm, yeah. because it was a very uh, well problematic country at everything. the time. It was lacking everything because you see the Belgians had thought that they could Just stay forever. forever yeah. And they yeah. had the, the idea first all people, all uh, Congolese have to go to the primary school mm -hmm. and then to secondary school and only after that we will send them to the university. Mm -hmm. And the result was that there were only eight or ten mm -hmm. academics when the country became independent. independent. And so... Um, when we went there in '64, uh, well, it, it, there was a civil war going, going on. on yeah, yeah. That, that's so the question I was going to ask you. It was a terrible situation. I mean, this was really not normal. Yeah. Why did you decide to? Why did you choose the Congo? Well, you see, sometimes things happen uh, in life. We saw this uh, situation. Yeah, we the, the situation was not that bad when we applied okay. uh, for the jobs. Mm -hmm. And our, our jobs uh, were in Kisangani. Mm -hmm. So we went on our honeymoon to France okay. in the summer of 64. And when we came back, uh, Kisangani had been taken over well, by the rebels. rebels. So we received a telegram from the Congolese government, don't come right now, uh, uh, till, uh, till we let so you know. So, uh, well, we were puzzled, we had no jobs and we were waiting and uh, we had no house. Uh, mm. So we were thinking, what shall we do? And then suddenly there was a telegram saying, just come to Kinshasa mm -hmm. and uh, the university has moved over to Kinshasa oh, for now. Okay. That so was the Free University. Uh, the the Université Libre du Libre. Congo, yeah, the, the, Congo, the Free University of Congo. It was a Protestant university. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was in exile and stayed with the Catholic University, okay. where they had not enough teachers either. So for them it was interesting, and for the Free University it was also interesting because there was a place for the students to go to oh, good, and yeah. for the staff. So we spent a few years first in Kinshasa and then we moved later to Kisangan. Oh, yeah. When the situation was improved. When the situation was a bit improved, mm -hmm. yes. And then Mobutu decided that three universities for that country was too much. There should be only one. Mm -hmm. The Université Nationale oh, yeah. du, Con uh, du Congo and uh, it was the the national so became one national university. So all the arts faculties, the three they had in one in much. Kinshasa, one in Kisangani, one in Lubumbashi, had to move over to uh, Lubumbashi. Okay. So he decided that in June and the first of September we were all militarily moved in C hundred and thirty yeah, airplanes yeah, with uh, dogs and goats and. And, and chickens, everything in the really? same plane. <laughs> it was quite interesting as an experience. <laughs> so that was 1970. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then um, we, went, we came to Lubumbashi, but there was a strange situation. You had three triple staff there mm -hmm. because, uh, well, from the, the three the universities. Yeah. yeah, so. And the Belgians in particular, they started, uh, they were insisted on having jobs. And my husband and I said to each other, look, we are here, but we came here because there were no Congolese. Mm -hmm. So the Congolese should have priority mm -hmm. to have jobs. But the Belgians are insisted. Well, because they had a sort of arrangement that for five years in the Congo, you got a sort of uh, retirement fee mm -hmm. or I don't know what. So, and then we said, uh, let's uh, try and find a job back in the Netherlands. So my husband found a, a job immediately, okay. and I didn't. So, but then the, ch the kids were small, so I studied for two more years. And after that, okay. I... Yeah. And please, let's go back to the Congo experience. Yes. The first time you go to Africa, the continent. Yes. What was your impression? I mm. found 
people very friendly and uh, and open and uh, you could discuss many many things uh, uh, with the people in Congo. Yeah, but you came but from the sure. west. Yes. Where the media was uh, always uh, telling stories about Africa. Yes. And then you saw the real thing. Was there yeah. any connection between uh, what the media was telling well, you and yeah. what you experienced? Well, that's a very interesting question. You see, when I came, when I arrived, mm. uh, I, f I must tell you, I was there to teach French literature. So I was teaching Victor Hugo and, um, and oh, all yeah. uh, other uh, French mm. uh, writers. Mm. And then I decided, it is strange, there is so much uh, French literature, uh, African French literature, Francophone African mm -hmm. literature. So I began, t because that I was, I had never had any teaching, any education in African literature, because mm -hmm. in my faculty it was French, French, French uh, literature, European. Literature. European. Mm -hmm. So then I saw in the in the books I read and I, I worked as much as I could and I thought it would it will be interesting and this is an answer to your question. Mm -hmm. It will be interesting to know more what African writers say okay. about European okay. characters. And um, then I discovered something very interesting, which is that all the stereotypes that you find in Europe about Africans, mm -hmm. that in African novels you find similar stereotypes about, about Europeans. And so I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. The more I read and I decided to write my PhD mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. If in Europe uh, the, the stereotype is that Africans are lazy, mm -hmm. in, in African mm -hmm. novels you find how lazy the Europeans are because they make Africans do all the work for them. In uh, in Europe, uh, there there are uh, how do you prejudices uh, about Africans who uh, who are not civilized in quotation marks. But in African novels, I found the observation: how can uh, how can people be civilized if they have caused two savage uh, world, world wars. World war, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I read in one of your books also that uh, the, Af the African writers have dif had difficulty identifying with uh, uh, the uh, European female because they always think that they are over pampered. Yes. That's part of the things you discover. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So there are all those... Prejudice all around. Yes. But you, you can turn them around mm -hmm. and then you see, so it is in human nature to stereotype okay. others. Yeah, so as soon as you know that... But it becomes a problem when you use it to oppress other people, if, if you use yes, your prejudice sure. to impose uh, yes. your values on is a There is a difference in power then, in you mean, equation, uh, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but what is interesting in, uh, in the development mm -hmm. in African literature is that Finally, the Europeans didn't play a role anymore mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. So after '66 or so, mm -hmm. that was yeah, that change. disappeared in the novels. No. So it, there was a sort of writing back yeah. for a while, and then you see the the writers felt it more as their responsibility okay. to talk about themselves. Much, much more, much more and more. Important. They find themselves more important than... Uh, yes, okay. yes. But you see, other things that I uh, discussed with students, for example, mm -hmm. after, uh, when I was there about a month or so, uh, some of the students said, uh, Madame, can I ask you a question? Yes. Mm -hmm. A very personal question. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Well, you know, you spent your whole day with men. Yeah. The whole class was full of men. Mm -hmm. There were no girls then yet. What about your husband? Can he accept that? <laughs> <laughs> what was your answer? My answer was, well, you see, if in a, in a marriage you cannot trust each other, the marriage is, is a very bad marriage. But my wife cannot even go to the market by herself. 
<laughs> I said, well, then you have a problem. <laughs> you have to trust her. Yeah, so in some of your literature, you explore these uh, prejudices, uh, which is all over the place. Yeah. But you never try to see why it becomes problematic by the imposition. You yeah. never explore that in your novels. Uh, I, I did in, well, particularly in the relation uh, between men and no, women, women in, yeah. late, in later... But not work. between the races. Well, you see, my analysis was what happened in the books. Yeah. And, uh, well, of course there, there were... Uh, yes, well, it, it is true that the, the writers uh, refer to it, and, and but the analysis I I, I did, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, w I went into that in mm -hmm. the in my in my PhD. Yeah, it was it was a chapter. I was going to. You were the first uh, Dutch uh, academic to uh, to look into this African. Uh, yes. How did yeah. they accept you? How did they? What well, was the reaction? It was not. You see, when I came to my PhD director with this topic, when yeah. I was, uh, after a year in Congo, I had decided that this w would be what I wanted to do. Then, well, he was a professor of French literature, so he said to me, look, I can, I've just come back from Paris mm -hmm. and I found a, a 17th century poet in the Bibliothèque Nationale. Mm -hmm. And nobody has written about it. Why don't you take that no. subject? I said, I am very sorry, but <laughs> my life has changed so much mm. uh, by looking at uh, European literature from an African perspective that I, I can't do such a topic anymore. This is no, not possible. So I have to write this PhD about mm. African novels. What changed you then? The thing is, you see, when you live in Europe, mm. Things going on here are very self-evident and you don't question uh, things as much as when you look from another place, oh, from outside. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, when in 65 uh, Kisangani was liberated uh, from, the re from the rebels, uh, I became aware that this liberation with American airplanes okay. and Belgian paratroopers was only possible after American elections in November. Because, you see, the sitting president mm -hmm. didn't want to take any risk. So, yeah, so you start seeing better how world politics mm -hmm. um, decide about the fate of people in countries that have nothing to do with the West. And uh, so I think that was an important eye-opener for me. And from then on, you saw more of those mechanisms. Yeah, the question now is, many Europeans go to Africa like you did, but they never had this uh, epiphany, if I may use the word epiphany. Yeah. They, yeah, life goes on for them. Yeah. But for you, it yes. seems to have a profound uh, yes. influence. Yeah, right? yeah because I talked uh, with my students. Yeah. You listen to them. And yes, of course, yes. Yeah, if you can't be a good teacher, if, if you, you can't listen. listen to your students. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, something very important. And I must say, I learned as much as they did, yeah, probably. You, okay. um, you are in Africa for many, several years. And we have what they call or, uh, oral literature, oral literature. Yes, yeah. Did you take time to do, look into some of them? And what do you think of them in comparison to the written the, the literature? literature? Well, you know, um, as Chinua Achebe said, uh, in Africa, proverbs are the palm oil with which words are eaten. We're going to talk about your proverbs later. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, mm. s you heard people use proverbs in Congo, mm. and I, this is all over all Africa, Africa the case. So, there was a, a, a woman once and she said, you know, eating with a woman is eating with a witch. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? <laughs> she said, well, you know, this is what we say to our sons when they are going to marry. Okay. Because the woman, mm -hmm. the other woman comes from outside, mm -hmm. so my son, mm -hmm. be careful, mm -hmm. as she is a stranger, she is from outside the family. 
So um, <laughs> it, it means it means that's something. A, you that's see. a profound meaning which you have to decipher. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So uh, that's one example. Okay. And uh, so I started collecting proverbs yeah, yeah. gradually. Yeah, okay. And do you, uh, in the Congo, were you able to listen to Moonlight stories, African stories? Yes, them, yes, you know? yes, yes. What do you think of them? Well, what was the experience for you? Well, it like is, it is, yeah, it's fascinating. Mm. And um, so I collected also stories with students. So you actually sat down with them? Listening to the service? Yes, yes, mm. yeah, yeah. How did they think of you? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. Uh, mm. I think they liked th my interest. In the, uh, I'm sure yeah. they liked that. Yeah. Okay. And and, but another experience, when our f eldest son was born in Congo, okay. uh, what I found very moving was that neighbors, people around heard that the child had been born and they came knocking at the door and said, okay. thank you, thank you for having a child, thanking, and I... You didn't understand it? I didn't understand first, but then later I was aware that it meant uh, that those who give birth add strength to the community. And uh, I mm -hmm. found this Extraordinary! You would never. Yeah, from a uh, European uh, perspective, yes. it's really. Yes. Yeah. You didn't. You didn't yeah. think of it like uh, adding anything to the family. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So I thought uh, okay. this was a very moving uh, aspect of uh, of the okay. cultural environment then. Serious, yeah. And so there were all sorts of those questions. Another experience I had, well, there is, was a lot of witchcraft around in Congo. And a lot of uh, most African countries. Yes, yes. So I had a colleague, a Congolese colleague, and we went with our first year students to visit the museum. And um, so he had told me that his father he had always he couldn't sleep, he was always fearful that well, evil that spirits would, would come to catch him. <laughs> and then the missionaries came to the village and they told him, well, there was one God who was stronger than, than all the Wishes. evil spirits. <laughs> and he said, I have seen my father changed from one day to the other. And he was, he was got rid. Good. Yes, he, he became a relaxed person and I had never known him like that. Mm -hmm. So with this colleague I went to this museum yeah. and uh, the curator was ill and but the guard said, well, I can show you around. Mm, okay. And so we came in one room of the museum with lots of uh, objects, uh, magical, uh, My, okay. powerful, uh, voodoo, yeah, things. yeah, yeah. Uh, juju okay. and things like that. And some students were so frightened, yeah. they, they said, well, in our village, we cannot even look at but those was, uh, things. But it was in a museum. It was, this was in a museum. Mm. So my colleague said, would you mind that you and I touch all the objects? Oh, you did? And uh, we, oh, we asked permission. We asked the guard for permission. He said, yes, but it's uh, on the shelves. Not it is said, mm. ne pas toucher, s'il vous plaît. Mm. Don't touch, please. So it's at your own risk, because this warning is not okay. in vain. So, <laughs> and we, the, we put our hands on all the objects, uh, and just so to show the students. There was no power there. There was no power there. How did they react to it? And they were, they were discussing, and they said, how did they dare do this? This is imp <laughs> something impossible. So you see, mm. there were lots of, of experiences. Uh, this is a sharing of experiences. Yeah. Uh, concerning your PhD, I read the quotation, which was uh, it was written of you, and I quote: "You have de dedicated yourself to the developing of uh, and the developing the field of intercultural literary studies." Yeah. What is intercultural literary studies? It is uh, studying the relations between literatures and different cultures. Okay. And um, I came to that first uh, from from the Proverbs, because um, starting from African Proverbs, of course, people asked me, do you know any European Proverbs? And I remember my grandmother saying, uh, girl, put your skirt down, 
Otherwise, the if not, the stork will come. Well, it rhymes in Dutch. Yeah. yeah. Meisje, doe je rokje neer, anders komt de ooie veer. <laughs> and uh, it means that a girl should be decent, be because otherwise she will get pregnant. <laughs> But then I, d I decided it's, it's so interesting to know about m mothers and daughters and brides and co-wives and uh, mothers-in-law and widows. So I collected Wonderful. many proverbs from Africa and also from Europe and later also from other no, continents. we'll talk about the proverbs. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, but then you find, and that's why the intercultural uh, studies. studies question no, comes no. in, um, I thought, I expected to find especially differences. And, uh, but there were so many similarities. similarities. Mothers are praised everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mothers in law are proverbially yeah, yeah, hated okay. everywhere. Okay. The widows are suspect That's because the they, may have, yeah, yeah. Okay. they may have killed their husband, mother, as okay. the proverbs mm. say. Okay. Many mothers prefer sons to daughters. That is really true in the culture yeah. history. Okay. We take this short break and when we come back uh, we continue with uh, Professor Skipper. On this program, focus on Africans hosted by the popular Pan-African writer Femi Akpomolafe who has devoted his entire life to championing African cause. We are like this problem and try to look for solution. Focus on Africans is a program to watch to meet with those with passion to build a better African for ourselves and the coming generations. Focus on Africans. Together we can build a better Africa. Welcome back viewers. Uh, the program is still focused on Africans. And today we have the privilege to be talking with uh, Professor Mineke Skipper. And uh, yeah, this discussion is about literature and also the co connection between cultures. Uh, you are explaining to us uh, the, what you discovered from uh, studying different, different cultures. You said there are a lot of yes, similarities. Yes, yes. Well, there are, uh, first of all, cultures uh, have connections in two ways. Mm -hmm. One way is that uh, there are influences. You see, cultures meet and they influence each other. Sure. They have an impact on each other. And uh, but there is uh, the other thing is that there are also similarities in cultures that have never been in contact with each other. Mm -hmm. like For example, we have proverbs not only in uh, Africa but also in. South America, or in Europe, or in Australia, so you or in believe Asia. that uh, uh, proverbs are independently discovered by every society? Well, not every possibly. I haven't. I no, can't they say that because they haven't most society. explored that. But mm -hmm. th it is it is amazing that metaphors in proverbs, have, for example, uh, women in every culture. almost every culture. Is the uh, the metaphor referring to women is a, a pot or a, or a, a bag? A yeah, it, it means the womb. Yeah. And, and so that's quite but, uh, interesting. That's, uh, for you to well, we can talk more about. about that, so okay. that, that's an, an example of uh, we share. Yeah, and why why do we share so much? In my opinion, we share. First of all, the shape and the functions of our bodies mm -hmm. as men and, and women. Mm -hmm. And also our basic needs like shelter and food and, uh, and procreation. And also similar fears and uh, insecurities. And uh, the question now arises, if we uh, human beings share these uh, common traits, what do you think is responsible for this? Uh, Lack of cultural understanding, if I may put it that way, or because cultural intolerance. Because you see, this is a this is a message uh, that doesn't come first to mind. So societies are thinking in differences. You see, mm -hmm. in order to to give things a place, you make differences, and differences always mean hierarchies too. Unless you start questioning the hierarchy, 
Yes, the hierarchy. But who are supposed to be questioning the hierarchies then? Uh, well, I think that, you, well, if it's a matter of power, you have to accept certain hierarchies in order to survive. To survive yeah. But then uh, there are moments that people start speaking out. And I think then the, the yeah, can, yeah, two things can happen. You can talk about it, it? or, uh, well, violence is, yeah. the, is the result. That's a result of it. Uh, but you, as a writer yourself, do you believe that writers have special obligation? society. I think all people have obligations. Not only, not only writers. Not only writers, no. You don't believe that writers have special obligations because they have... Uh, well, I think we have a special obligation mm -hmm. uh, towards writers in prison. Towards not to society in, in general? Uh, well, we have, with all the uh, citizens, okay. we have, of course, uh, our moral obligations to mm -hmm. society. But then we also have this uh, special obligation, at least in, in, I have been part of the Writers in Prison Committee oh, of yeah. International Pen. So I have met writers in prison and I have written letters for writers in prison to protest okay, against, the imprisonment against their imprisonment. Okay. Because you see, with the imprisonment of the writer or the journalist, or the messenger, uh, you the, yes, the, the the messengers, you also imprison in a way the readers, yeah, because, yeah. and so it is it is mm. crucial for society to have a moral voice r raised yeah. by, by those who, who have the are abilities? who have the abilities. Yes. Yeah, that's why I ask the question. If you take the example of uh, the Netherlands, for example, uh, uh, let's take it as an example. We see a lot of uh, intolerance going on, and uh, people talking about. Oh, Culturally culturally superior and uh, the uh, they're focusing on the Isla, uh, Muslims now. Yes. That uh, yeah. It's very yeah. shocking. It's yeah. Um, you you studied cultures. You know how much uh, Muslim has given to the European culture, mm -hmm. and how much uh, the culture has been influenced by all this. So I uh, ask this question: Why should writers like you, with uh, high level contacts, why you want to do more? Instead of waiting for angry writers from the Arab world to yes, I to see. I see your point. Yeah. Yes, well, I'm working in certain respects here uh, to promote the culture from Muslim countries. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's also a responsibility. We have okay. many responsibilities, and the that's more a, you open your I eyes, I the more responsibilities <laughs> we have. You. But we can only do very but little. Yeah. But I okay. think the things that we can do, we, we must do. Okay. And then let's talk about the University of uh, Leiden, yes. where you moved to after your PhD. Yes. You have a very rich uh, African study center, have you been there? Yes, yes. What was it like for you? <laughs> to move to Leiden? Yeah. I think the difference with my job at the Free University mm -hmm. uh, was that in Leiden you have all those departments studying cultures from uh, from uh, the world. So uh, I cooperated with colleagues uh, working uh, on Arabic literature, mm -hmm. on Chinese and uh, Japanese literature, and uh, or we have specialists on Oceania and on mm -hmm. Amerindian cultures. Yeah, so for me everywhere. it was, it was uh, f very, very stimulating. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Without being in, in Leiden, I wouldn't have been able to yeah. do this uh, this huge research Sorry, on uh, collecting f more than 15,000 uh, proverbs uh, about women yeah. from around <laughs> the world. Okay. And uh, do you remember some of your students from Africa? Yes, yes. Can you mention some names? Mention some names. Yeah, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, in Kashama, uh, mm. Pius and Gandu, and Gandu and Kashama, okay, well, you know? Not really. You don't know him. He's, well, those are names from Mugan, Congo, Jean Kitin, okay. there, there are many. But did any of them become famous? Any of your students? Uh, some colleagues have become famous. Uh, mm. For example, uh, Valentin Moudimbe. 
Valentin Mulimbe. You know the name? I know the name, but I don't know. Yeah, what it yeah. And uh, and his uh, former wife uh, Elizabeth mm. Boyi Mudimbe. Oh, okay, they become yeah. very famous. Well, famous. Are, they, uh, are you still in contact with them? Yes, oh, yes, well. yes. Sure. All yeah. right then. And um, since the year 2000, the Chinese uh, Academy of Social Sciences have been inviting you to yes. for cooperation. Yeah. About uh, the stories of creation. No, no, that was first, it was about the epic. The epic, okay, the epic. Yes, yes. I had uh, studied uh, African epics okay. and uh, worked with other colleagues in Leiden mm -hmm. on a book of uh, epics. epics and heroes. Mm -hmm. So then one day we had a visitor from China a woman, a Tibetologist. Tibetologist. <laughs> and she um, was preparing the World Congress of Tibetologists in Leiden. Mm -hmm. So I uh, became f uh, friends with her. And then she said, would you please come and address the World Congress of Tibetologists? In China? Uh, no, in, oh, in, uh, in Leiden. Leiden. And I said, well, I'm not a Tibetologist, <laughs> I don't even know mm. Chinese or Tibetan, mm. so what is the, what is the relevance? Mm. And she said, no, but the things you know, the Tibetologists don't, don't know. Mm. So please, uh, do me a favor. So I talked mm. about uh, intercultural relations, mm. I talked about genres in... Uh, as fairy tales and epics, no, and uh, they had uh, the, Tib the Tibetans have very famous epics. Okay. So you see, you sometimes you give a talk, and all the energy of the public comes back to you. Oh, you it was a very nice oh. afternoon. We you had. enjoyed it. <laughs> I enjoyed it, oh. and then afterwards she said, "You know, now you must come to Beijing, because our Institute of Minority Cultures at the oh. Academy of Social Sorry, Sciences." Sir need people like you to work with. Have you been doing that? So yes, I came there, we organized two workshops on the EPIC in mm. China and in the rest of the world oh. and in Africa. And so they were very, very interested. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, we wrote a book together about EPICs okay. and heroes in Chinese mm. minority cultures. Okay. And then we came indeed to the to the creation mythology. They wanted mm. to do another project with me. How far, how far are you with that? Uh, next month, in April, two Chinese colleagues Colleague. will come here and uh, we will Collaborate. adapt the papers for uh, mm. and edit the papers for uh, publication. Yeah, the question I want to ask uh, is, looking at it from a global perspective, yes. is there a common trend among the uh, cultures on uh, mythology and creation? Oh, Cosmo. yes, yes, yes. What do you find? Um, well, you know, the point is always, as I tell my students, if you look for differences mm -hmm. between cultures, you will only find differences. But if you look for similarities, they are there too. So we, we have as much uh, differences as we have uh, um, similarities. similarities. So, um, well, the questions people have been asking always, mm. uh, ever since uh, human memory. Mm. Where do we come Don't from? And where are why we are we here? And where are we going? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, why are there men and women in the world? Or why do we have to toil for our daily bread? And... Um, where does inequality come from? Those mm. questions. Those are questions uh, caught yes. across the uh, yes. cultures. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then at the same time, uh, people invent their own answers. They have their own stories. And mm -hmm. But even then, you see, if you look at the very beginning, mm -hmm. then what you see is people imagine there was darkness and void. water and void mm -hmm. and <coughs> uh, that is common to uh, that is quite common mm -hmm. yes okay so uh, we also ask questions about how death came to the world of course and what comes uh, after 
like camera yes, like you did. Yes, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Let's move to your literary output. <laughs> You've written a uh, few, uh, these are some of the books from uh, Professor Skipper. She has written uh, about 19 books, if I'm correct, and edited uh, 11 other books. Yes. And then, uh, I'm going to show some of these. Uh, This is Never Marry a Woman with Big Feet, Women's in Proverbs from Around the World. Imagine Outsiders, African and the Question of Belonging. This is a source of all evil, African proverbs and saying on women. And uh, this is the Arabic translation. Uh, be like this. <laughs> Arabic translation of uh, uh, Never Marry a Woman. Never marry a woman uh, with big feet. That's uh, the Arab this is the English translation. This is the Arabic translation. Uh, you'll be very productive. And, yes. Uh, yeah. It's a difficult question to ask, but you have a favorite among your books. Um, <laughs> I think uh, the PhD. I didn't. Uh, it was one of my favorites. Yeah, right, right, right. But now the new one that's uh, will be published next week in Dutch. Mm -hmm. uh, the book about creation and origin is about the first people. Will come. Uh, it will be published in Dutch next week, and it will come out in English, I think, a year later. Oh. And the title is "In the Beginning There Was No One." In the beginning, there was no one. And the subtitle is "How the First People Came Into Being." Mm -hmm. So, uh, and in that book, I'm talking about. How did the gods create us? Uh, why did the gods create us? How did uh, how do we connect okay. to stones and plants and animals? To other things in the world. And also, uh, where does inequality come from? Mm. So the first part of that book is about uh, humans. How do did we come here? And the other. Part is the next part of the book is about how men and women came into being. Oh, cool, 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 cool. Uh, you explain it from a philosophical or religious viewpoint? Or? Uh, it is an analysis of stories again, oh, you cool, see. Cool. Bringing the stories together and, mm -hmm. and seeing where are the similarities, mm -hmm. where are the differences. How do people solve the, the problem okay. of explaining mm -hmm. why we look as we look, mm -hmm. yeah, for example, how did different races come into come being? To be, yeah, yeah. How how come if in the in the beginning people had no sex, no genitals? Mm -hmm. okay. How did they get them? And mm -hmm. uh, if there was male pregnancy in the beginning, in the beginning. how did men so this has transmit to the, to that to the ability to women? Okay. Uh, you see all those questions. We look forward to. <laughs> to uh, you said the English edition uh, will come out a year later. I hope oh, okay. it will come out over a, in a year or so. Yeah, apart from uh, producing so many books, you also find time to write for different newspapers. I have done all that, about, yes. Yeah. The question here is, can you imagine life without uh, the written world for you? What no, does, What I does can't. literature mean to you? It means my life, in fact. Mm -hmm. Because, you see, um, well, the, the connection with other people mm -hmm. just in life is the most important well, thing. Then. But then the way you find out more, mm -hmm. thanks to uh, books. Books, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, book, a book is a very important means of communication. So you, are, you can lose yourself in uh, just by reading books. You, you transport your yes, to yeah, another dimension. Yeah. But I, I could never have expected that some of those ideas about what we share in a in a in a in the global world mm -hmm. that it could have such an impact mm -hmm. the, the, in the Arab world. To my amazement, because I was worried that the the, the book might be uh, censored. Okay, yeah, but so the, because there's a whole chapter about sex mm -hmm. in the book because okay. there are many proverbs well, about well, okay. it. But, but they no, it. They, no, they loved it, mm -hmm. and the book is a, has become a bestseller in, uh, in, in Egypt. Okay. Yes. Okay, viewers, uh, we we'll take this short break. When we come back, we we'll continue with uh, Professor Skipper, and we're going to explore some of our books.
this program focus on africans hosted by the popular pan-african writer femi akomolafe who has devoted his entire life to championing african cause we are like this problem and try to look for solution focus on africans is a program to watch to meet with those with passion to build a better african for ourselves and the coming generations focus on africans together we can build a better africa Welcome back, uh, viewers. Uh, we're having a very interesting discussion with uh, Professor Skipper. And uh, two of your books, Never Marry a Woman with uh, Big Feet, and uh, that's a proverb uh, from around the world, and uh, The Source of All Evil, African Proverbs and Sin of uh, Women. What is the theme of uh, women and proverbs? Well, uh, first yeah, of all, I have two title. questions, yeah? Yeah. Why are you so much interested in proverbs? <laughs> Well, as I told you, mm -hmm. my interest started in Congo. Yeah. However, people used proverbs very much yeah. and they were fascinating. So, um, I decided to do that research about proverbs because in many countries people have proverbs, use mm -hmm. proverbs. And um, so I wanted to compare. And uh, since so many proverbs in society are about women, okay. uh, I decided to take that as my topic. Uh, it started actually, this idea, when I had to do a, a book for an English publisher uh, who asked me to write a book about women and literature in different continents. Okay. And I decided that I couldn't do that, I would edit the book and other people should come in. So there was a section about the Arab world, a section about the Caribbean, a section about uh, Latin America, and about Asia okay. and Africa. And then as the editor of the book, I thought, well, let me uh, include some ornament to all the sections of proverbs about women. Yeah. And then I was amazed to find so many similarities. I had expected more differences mm -hmm. there in the proverbs because mm -hmm. people contributed from around the world. So I had about 30 for every section. But then really there were those uh, comments on the female body. Mm -hmm. the, the body is beautiful but dangerous. <laughs> That's one thing. Mm -hmm. And then the difference about mothers and daughters, uh, that the mothers love the mothers are loved everywhere, mm -hmm. but the daughters are not as much wanted as the boys, the as boys. the sons. Okay. Uh, for example, in Chinese there is a proverb, 18 golden daughters are less preferable than one son, even if he has a hunchback. Really? <laughs> really. <laughs> okay. So, um, the title of the mm. book, Never Marry well, a Woman mm, with mm, Big mm, Feet, uh, is uh, quite uh, interesting. It comes from Malawi and Mozambique, from the people who, the Sena people. Okay. But when I was quoting this proverb in Beijing, yeah. my colleague, specialist of proverbs, said, met with a big smile, we have the same proverbs. We say, yeah. a woman with big feet ends up alone in a room. She will never find a husband. Because she has a big feet. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And the Malawians uh, have the same thing. They have the people. same, yeah, and in India you have it, and in Hebrew you have a similar. Uh -huh. So I thought this the big feet are a metaphor, of course. Okay. Yeah, because, well, the, 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 the full proverb in, in Sena is, uh, Never marry a woman with bigger feet than you have yourself. Okay. So, well, a woman with big feet yep. is in general a tall mm -hmm. person. person okay. But uh, so don't marry a woman bigger than you. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. Well. So, but looking, having my database of fifteen thousand proverbs, mm -hmm. finally, it will be on the internet very soon. By now, that what I'm going to ask you. Yeah, yeah. Never marry a woman with if it contains uh, fifty. No, no, thousand. not the book. The yeah. book is an analysis. analysis of it but the material I used. Yeah, yeah, it came from the fifteen thousand. Uh, come fr from the collection over ten it years. Well, it's like collecting stamps. What other people do. You do it in between other things. But I met so many people and you I ask, always uh, asked. 
For when birth. I was in an airplane or in a taxi in some country, I always asked people, do you have a proverb about women? I'm thinking of the logistics here now. How do you collect uh, 15,000 proverbs and uh, making sure that uh, you're not collecting a double or triple? Well, you, you, you have to find out patiently. It is. It has been a long, terrible thing to do, yeah, but it was so, in the end it was rewarding. Okay. But I, I have suffered a lot, right? Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, did you use computer program to... Uh, in the to end I, I did, the yes, yes. Uh, first I had some, uh, file cards yeah, and then later, card. yes, yes, because when, when I started the, the, the the computer was not Never yet so uh, so much. Uh, yes. It start. It began only then. Ah. So, um, but now about this, <laughs> what I found. So this proverb really represents messages about women from around the world. Around the world okay. Because it's, you see, the messages I found was first the woman shouldn't be taller. She shouldn't be uh, more talented. She shouldn't, uh, especially she shouldn't have more verbal talent, because that is one of women's powers, to be verbally yeah. talented. And uh, she shouldn't be wealthier uh, than her uh, man, because the one who is wealthy That's shouts power. in the house. Has more power. Has more, yes, yeah, because mm. then you, you order, you give the, the commands. Because of the economic power. <laughs> yeah. Ah. So, in fact, that is very significant, mm. you see. It, I, it means I, that a woman is, in, in fact, quite powerful. Mm. Feminists have often thought that women were in the, in the victim position. But the proverbs show, uh, uh, show a lot of yeah. awe, mm. I think. On this uh, fantastic note, we're going to end the discussion today. My guest today is uh, Professor Minike Skipper, who has uh, been very generous with her time uh, today. Viewers, uh, thank you very much for watching the Focus on Africans. My name is Femi Akomalafe and uh, until next week when we come your way with uh, another edition, I've been working with uh, Smaila Suleimana, Saada to Suleimana, Marian Oboye, Remy Akomalafe and Grey Westerfeld. Until next week, I say, Ireo. Bye-bye. <laughs>